So about three years ago, I made a video called Chris Chibnall on Doctor Who, the story so far, upon hearing the news that he'd be taking over as the showrunner of Doctor Who. Uh, and that just looks back at his previous work, his previous episodes, Doctor Who and Torchwood, etc. Um, and of course, since that video was made, Doctor Who Series 11 has aired, which was show run by him and we wrote quite a few of the episodes and i've also watched all three series of broadchurch which was also written by him um so there's a bit more to talk about now i thought it was time for an update and uh, a slightly more analytical video looking at chris chibnall and doctor who and the recurring themes ideas motifs that appear in his doctor who work so today i'm joined by miles taylor hello uh, just to discuss this because uh yeah always better with two I was going to start this by saying, like, you know, when someone says Chris Chibnall and Doctor Who to you in the same sentence, what do you think of? That's an interesting question, actually. Yeah. I guess now it's it's slightly different. Before, if you asked me that question, I immediately, my brain would probably jump to his Series 7 episodes. I don't know mm. why. I just think that they have a distinctive Chibnall stamp on them. So I would think of Brian and Amy and Rory, that kind of stuff. I, it's an odd yeah. thought, that, yeah, actually. Yeah, that's true. I've never thought about that. Um, but now, I suppose, if you say Chris Chibnall on Doctor Who, I think of that really bad... You know that photo they used to it when they released the information that you the show? And <laughs> it's him looking like really dopey but with the, the red, microphone. And yeah. the red blazer or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, that one. Yeah. No, the one where it's oh. like, he looks like he's doing stand-up well, comedy. stand-up comedy, and he looks really yeah. depressed. I think of that, and I think of him, you know, obviously the Jodie Whittaker. I remember, era. like... It's bizarre. It must have been last awesome when the series came out, and there was like a new photo of him released, yeah, like, in a green blazer, <laughs> and it's like a new photo. And we've been waiting so long for that because they were using literally that just crap one yeah. or the one of him in the red the... blazer where he looks yeah, really yeah. grumpy. Because I was going to use that as well as a way of bringing up Chris Chibnall's first contribution to the Doctor Who universe yeah. back uh-huh. in 1986, uh, which was the open air clip infamous clip in which he criticises Trial of the Time Lord. How dare he? How dare right he? In front Terror of the Vervoids, the best part of Trial of the Time Lord. How dare he? <laughs> okay. Um, well, well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's another video in itself. Oh dear. I mean, he had some balls to do that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And it's so weird to think that he's now the showrunner. It is. Imagine that. Like, I remember like just watching that on the DVD mm. uh, and thinking, isn't that quite a novel thing that a guy who wrote Doctor Who later on you know, is is having a go at the people at that time, and now he's show running it. It's bizarre. It's yeah, so weird. It is. But it, but then again, it shows how much we change as people because Chris Chibnall back then was probably a, a very different Chris Chibnall to the one we've got mm. now. Well, yes. for the most yes. part, um, I think his his opinions and you know what he saw as makes a story great were very different to what definitely yes, now. definitely. It's interesting, and it's become almost like a meme of like <laughs> whenever an episode came out that he'd written recently, they'd always put. A clip up on Twitter of him saying, all his, "Yeah, his and, and like to be fair, some of the criticisms do work. Oh, if yeah. you think that about the episodes, some no, of those yeah. criticisms do uh, kind of sync up with, yeah. with I could well the episodes he's written. Yeah, yeah. I could well believe he was. You could about you could put them, yeah, put them next to each other, and you, you wouldn't know the difference. But also, like thinking that the future showrunner of Doctor Who is out there now, and like if you think about social media and the internet and all that kind of stuff that's there, yeah. like when they." I don't know, 20 years time or 30 well, years who, whatever. Yeah, who knows cause... when there's a new showrunner there'll be so much stuff to look back on like mm-hmm. the, all the because tweets I, and things I, like and... we are the the age group I guess mm. that will be in I, mean, I guess any age group will be taking over late, later on in time um, so it's bizarre to think that our equivalent of that of going on points of view will be people digging the whole Twitter <laughs> comments and, um, and old YouTube yeah. videos as well oh, isn't that weird like mm. imagine if the next showrunner was a a, he did Doctor Who YouTube videos back in the yeah. day, and um, and he gets all these things dragged up of him criticizing, I don't know, or her criticizing, yeah. um, you know, I don't know, Stephen Moffat's hell bent or something. It's it's bizarre. It's really weird. It is yeah. So as for Chris Chibnall's actual Doctor episodes, obviously the first one was forty two back in mm. two thousand and seven. Now, what do you make of this story? Uh, quite interesting actually because <laughs> I recently have been going back and um, I ah, rewatched yes. the Matt Smith era and the Peace Capaldi era and um, I've been going back and watching the Tenant era again yeah. uh, I was watching some of Series 3 and I got to 42 and I was like I just can't be bothered <laughs> I, I can't be bothered watching this I don't think it's a bad episode I just think it's quite a, a drawn out long boring one mm. um, I think it's a it's, it's quite run around um, yeah, it's odd. I think it's a bit meh. Yeah, I, I'd probably agree with you there. Um, I mean, the, the whole kind of the 42 thing, 42 minutes, it's a bit of a gimmick. It doesn't yeah. really... I mean, it's part of the story, isn't it? Because they have like, the countdown. But then, mm-hmm. even then... 
it's like I feel like this story needed something else. Like it has the sun thing. Maybe I mean, the sun it, thing was good. I, mean, yeah, I remember as, as a kid, okay. as a kid, I loved that. We were going around burn the playground, me. going play, playground, yeah. playground, going <laughs> you know, burn with me and and all that sort of stuff. Mm. That was great. But um, yeah, I just I mean, as a kid, I guess I did I did quite like it, but. Um, I always think of like the stories as you know they used to be released in volumes on the DVDs, uh, yes. and that was released with Lazarus Experiment and Daleks in Manhattan. All and right, the Daleks. <laughs> uh, the ones I'd always go back and watch is the Dalek ones. I don't think if there was an episode on that DVD that I watched the least, it was Forty Two. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting. I as a first effort, I suppose it's okay, but if you showed me that episode back in that time and you said that guy's going to become the showrunner in 10 years <laughs> I would have gone what really yeah. R- that guy also as a fun fact it's got Vinette is it Ro- Robinson yes it has, or Robson, it has yeah. the Vinette Rose Parks yeah. Yeah, I was watching Sherlock as well the other day in, and she's in, she's in that, she's that as well too, yeah. Rosa Parks yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just a, a fun weird connection there mm-hmm. And and it's interesting watching that old Chibnall clip from the 80s and he's talking about oh it's very <laughs> run of the mill it's very, very quite yeah. cliche 42 is a is a bit it's like a bit, that, you know. It's it's, like it's very run around. Yeah. It's very, uh, I guess it's like a base mm. under siege kind of story. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, looking back now, it's sort of similar. I guess you can draw parallels between that and the Stranger Conundrum a bit, maybe. Yes, but, you're right. Actually, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's for, yeah. Maybe it's just a little bit. Um, but moving on to the Silurian two parter from 2010, his next effort. What do you think of this one? Um. I think it's okay. I, yeah. I I I don't mind it. Again, it's not standout, but um, hmm. yeah. I think it, it it was good for what it was uh, at the time. I don't think it was one of my favourites from series five, but I still remember enjoying it. Um, hmm. Yeah, I can't quite place my finger on what I think of this one. It's one that we we overlook. I think. Quite oh, a lot. definitely, definitely. Um, I think a lot of people kind of. There are, there are two approaches to it. either that they just don't like it or skip over it or whatever or they say oh it's just the Silurians from the 70s all over again yeah but then that's but the thing it's, with, it's going to be it's inevitable yeah, isn't it yeah because with that story you cannot do anything else <laughs> mm. like um, you know people yeah they say oh can we have another Silurian story another sea devil story but I think we've we've that that concept is is done now we can't yeah, do anything pretty, else pretty much it. I guess that's why um, all we've had since is Vastra because <laughs> there's yeah. there's no other Silurian story to be told, I don't think. For me, it is it is a sort of underrated story. I think um, yeah, yeah. it is overlooked. I just I don't know. I just I, I like the whole uh, the whole premise, and you have that kind of family unit. Family crops begin in series eleven, but you have Mo and Ambrose and Elliot, don't you? And then Nazreen and yeah. Tony too. So that's like a little thing. Um, lots of kind of nice character moments, I think, and kind of family issues because the well, actually, thinking about it now the. The child goes missing. That's a bit kind of broad churchy, isn't it? Yeah, um, you're right. Yeah, Elliot, Elliot this is broad going church missing. Prototype, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, I, I think it's okay. As you say, probably not, not amazing. It's, it, I think pacing wise, I think Hungry Earth is quite slow, and mm. I think Cold Blood is too quick. Do you know what I mean? I think Perhaps, if they yeah. if if they'd shifted the place of the cliffhanger so that. We could have bumped a bit oh, of cold blood into yeah, yeah, because the cliffhanger is quite. Cliffhanger is a bit abrupt, isn't it? It's yeah, just like, it's like oh, here's an oh, alien oh, city. oh wow, yeah, <laughs> and that's not really. I remember, I remember watching that when it went yeah. out, and I didn't get what was going on. <laughs> I, I, I almost it caught me off guard. I was like, whoa, mm. is that the end? Yeah, um, I almost think they should have took a bit off cold blood and put that into so just yeah, just maybe. spaced it out a bit maybe. because it seems like a very slow. Hmm. I guess it's slow build up, but then cold blood just seems to rattle through, and it's like. So we've got a peace treaty, we've got this, we've got that, we've got, oh, someone's killed someone, oh, no, I know, and then drill, bang, and then it's, it's over. So, um, yeah, I think pacing is one of my little issues with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, like I say, it's not, I think it is a bit underrated, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So next up is Chibnall's Series 7 work, Series 7 Part 1, yeah. and the first of those which... Isn't that of... weird, by the way, just before we talk yeah. about how he had... That series five episode, nothing for series six, and then suddenly he's writing like half like of two, series yeah, seven, well, half yeah. episodes, yeah. And and but I mean, if you think about it, it's a series seven part one. Mm. He's written that is basically half. It's basically of half of it, isn't it? Stuff, isn't yeah. it? yeah, half yeah. Moffat, half Chibnall. That's then, really bizarre. Yeah, Table House. Um, but yeah, the, the first thing actually before his episodes in, themselves is Pond Life, isn't it? Yeah, it, it like, doesn't feel like a Chibnall thing. You know, if you take there are those two episodes of Dinosaurs and Spaceship in the Power of Three, and then you've got Pond Life before. 
and then PS, which is like set after. So there is quite yeah. a lot of that that's written by. He's, Shibble, he's yeah, because if you think about like Town Called Mercy is completely Town Called Mercy could have been in series six, couldn't it? Really? Yeah. Um, and Asylum of the Daleks is again, I guess that could have been placed in series six as well. The the very sort of series seven, the, you know, the family plot mm. line of. The Amy and Rory plotline is very much through Chibnall stuff. I mean, there's a bit in Asylum and obviously yeah. in Angels Take Manhattan, but it's um, it's interesting how much of that is from Chibnall. Well, because um, it's, it's Brian Williams, isn't it? Because he, he's yeah, in well, yeah, Chibnall's yeah, yeah. episodes, and that's like the it's one of the threads that's part of it, isn't it? Because mm. in terms of the kind of build up to it, uh, to Amy and Rory's exit, that's like the emotional thread, and it's like, are they going to stay with him or go with the Doctor? And then yeah. at the end of the Power of Three, where it's like. He's like, go with them, you know. Um, but oh, are they going to return? Yeah. Are they going to come back? The Power of Three is almost like an extended version of Pond Life. Well, I suppose you say Pond Life is like a yeah. shortened version of yeah. Power of Three because it's that sort of thing of the Doctor bouncing around doing this and that and Amy Rory's home life. And it's it's almost like a condensed version of Power mm. of Three. Because um, I was going to say, power, like Pond Life does, feels more like a Moffat script than yeah, I um, think it, I think Power of Three. Yeah. Then not Power of Three, then Chibnall stuff. But um, thinking about Power of Three in relation to Pond Life, it is quite similar, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's fair. That's fair but then there are elements yeah. of Pond Life which do seem very Moffaty, and I'm sure he had a hand in, mm. in you know, yeah, in a lot of that stuff. Um, yeah, because I've um, I've been recently reading the writer's tally. I was Russell just Davies. about to say yeah, that yeah. as well. And it's like he's I, one of the writers that Russell never, never rewrites. Re-wrote yeah, I reread yeah. that bit and it was like, uh, <laughs> but it was such a bizarre select. So you said um, there's four writers, I think it's four writers yes, he doesn't rewrite. Um, Stephen Moffat, okay, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Chris Chibnall, which was just for 42. <laughs> and then Stephen Greenhorn, oh, gosh, who wrote yeah. Lazarus Experiment, Doctor's Daughter. Ooh. And Matthew, whatever his name oh, is. Oh, Graham, fear Matthew her. Graham, yeah. who fear her. I'm like, what? Why? Maybe he should have rewritten Maybe, them. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe that's why <laughs> maybe that would have made a difference. Because he didn't... Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. But that, yeah. I, that was really strange. But Chibnall as well. Um, he obviously trusted... Like, Rusty Davis obviously trusted him as a writer. It's mm. interesting that he didn't use him more than once. I guess he did use him on Torchwood, though, didn't he? So. But yeah, it's interesting, that thing. So I'd like to know how much of a say Chibnall had and, and Stephen Moffat in the Series 7 stuff whether Moffat yeah. had quite a big hand or not uh-huh. um, I think he might have done I, yeah, yeah I suspect he probably did uh, so moving on to the episodes themselves it's obviously there's dinosaurs in a spaceship and the power of three now when I was thinking about dinosaurs in a spaceship just yesterday I was thinking that you've got that massive TARDIS team haven't you you've got Amy, Rory the Doctor Graham just throw a, a com- oh, not Graham I said, Graham, Brian, throw a, throw a granddad <laughs> well, in they're, there. They're practically, they're practically the, same. the same, aren't they? Um, throw, throw a granddad in there with a companion, and then we've got Nefertiti and John, John Riddell, Riddell, and that's like, yeah, all, so that's like six people, six strong TARDIS team. And we'd, we'd had stuff like that before, but yeah. I think that's kind of foregrounding like the whole Team TARDIS mm-hmm. gang thing, isn't it? It's very much like a, a gang. Um, as I say... Yeah, that's what he says, isn't it? He says he's he got does, a gang. I'm sure he says team. it in the dialogue, yeah. Yeah, I'd have yeah. to I'd have to go back and see that, but um, but definitely, and Brian obviously, yeah, Granddad, he's just like Graham, but like what six or seven years too early. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting because, like I said, I, I was rewatching the Matt Smith era not mm. too long ago, series seven, uh, as you know, as a whole. I used to really love it, and it's kind of gone down in my estimations. In fact, mm. I prefer series six to series seven now. I think I don't know if that's I controversial. I, prob- I think I probably do. Yeah, but um. Yeah, particularly part one. I don't know what it is. Uh, again, I know no, that's not really analytical of me, but like, uh, especially dinosaurs on a spaceship. It's fun. It's light. Um, it's got a, quite a nice tone to it. But there, the, it just does feel like there's not. What's the message behind it? If that makes sense. Yes. I mean, is it is yeah. it about ownership? Is it you know how? You know this this character um, played by David Bradley, I've forgotten his name, Solomon, um, wants to own these creatures, and he's he's only thinking about profit. Is it about that, or is it about we've got this game hunter who who likes to kill animals and whatnot, and Nefertiti yeah, the, the fancies morality him of and that isn't really explored. Is well, it? Like, yeah, because he just kind of gets like, to kill the dinosaurs. This is a, vid- a video <laughs> I've watched previously. Who went into this, and like Nefertiti has slaves and owns people like that oh, and yeah. then david bradley's character i've forgotten ah. solomon I, keep, I just keep forgetting his name um he 
then okay. owns Nefertiti, yeah, doesn't he? So it would have been nice if she went, oh, I realised that's what I do. Oh, that's quite bad, that. <laughs> but no, no, she just decides to marry this this guy who shoots animals. And, yeah. and he doesn't learn anything either because they're, they're stunning the dinosaurs and... All right, they're not killing the dinosaurs, but yeah. If you think about how like the characters, especially the guest characters, they don't move... change over the course of they the don't. story, like, they don't. Do and they, I guess really. you know it is only one episode, yeah. but like, um, why were they there then? Mm. Because that episode could have easily been dealt with by. It's true, yeah. Because um, I was thinking as well, like, if we look back at these episodes now, that like the pre-series eleven ones, do you think? They would, uh, if they hadn't been there, do you think they would appear in like a Chris Chibnall series or not? It's very interesting, actually. I don't know if dinosaurs in a spaceship would necessarily. I don't think it would. It didn't. It, um, if you think of the tone of series eleven, I think it's very. I different. think yeah. I think they. I don't know. There needs to be more to it, or maybe more kind of human issues, or, or yeah. something. Not quite right about that. Um, um, but there's there's also in terms of the dialogue in that episode as well. I think is a bit clunky. Uh, do you remember the series eleven overview video we did? Yes. Uh, I put a clip in that from Dinosaurs on a Spaceship of um, the Doctor, Brian and Rory in a cave um, when they're being attacked by the pterodactyls. Oh, yeah. And, and, it's like, and um, there's the robots. <laughs> and and I Look think, over there or something. Yeah, it? well, I think um, like that. Rory says something like, we're trapped. And he's like, yeah, thanks for spelling it out. And then Brian <laughs> says something like, they're coming this way, whatever it is. And he's like, yeah, spelling it out is literally inherent in you two. And it's like, but that's what you're, that's mm. literally what you're doing. Don't just point it out and that's a problem I had with series 11 as well because I, I felt that Chibnall has this tendency sometimes to literally spell it out for the audience and it, I think like he was saying in his 80s little clip which we'll <laughs> keep on coming back to the audience are smarter than writers sometimes give them credit for and I think sometimes Chibnall just doesn't well, in their scripts it doesn't seem like he thinks that because literally sometimes it's like oh Doctor... Like, in Woman Who Fell to Earth, I know we're jumping ahead a bit, but, like, there's the bit when Tim Shaw's there, they're all, uh, you know, about to... They see him from afar, and the Doctor runs off, then Yaz runs off, then Ryan... And then... Um, I keep calling him Brian Green. And then Bradley Walsh just goes, oh, now you're all running after it. And it's like, yes, we can see that you're running after Tim Shaw, because that's yeah, yeah, what you're okay. doing. Yeah, And it's... But, yeah, anyway, that's just my little... I mean, I wonder thing. as well, maybe, with that... I don't know whether some of it's, like, down to... The script there was perhaps making it clear Maybe. for the audience, but yeah, but yeah, if it is a thing it in Chibnall's yeah. episodes, I'm pretty sure there is. is, is I'm it? not sure who it is. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to check. So yeah, dinosaurs in a spaceship. Uh, the power of three. Then, so we've we've touched on this one a bit already, haven't we? Um, yeah. So I was watching this the other day, or just yesterday, in fact. Um, oh, I can't, I can't work out what I think of it. I think I, think I like it's it. It's got a good first half. Mm. And I think the conclusion is the most rushed pile of pigeon droppings I've yeah. seen because it's just literally he waves a sonic screwdriver and it's and it's done and and I just I just sit back and think wow <laughs> is that the best you can come up with I, and and the, sh- yeah. the shakri as well the shakri the shakri bring so they come onto the ship the shakri's like oh this is my evil plan and then he disappears. And leaving them completely free to wiggle his sonic screwdriver, and and all that that whole year of putting the cubes on Earth to stop the hearts, and literally when it comes when the Doctor's there, he just teleports away, and the Doctor's free to just sort yeah, it all out. Yeah, um, yeah, I I I do agree with that. Yeah. I, I think like in the deep dark corners of the web somewhere, I'm pretty sure I've seen before that apparently Stephen Burkoff, who was the Shakri was like a bit of a nuisance. Was it, was it Stephen Burkoff? Yeah. Oh it my was. giddy aunt. I it never was. knew that. Um, that is really bizarre. Oh my god. Mm. You know, it's been you every day. Yeah, but I, I think like he hammed it up. <coughs> he, he was deliberately trying to mess it up, I think. So well, apparently... Stephen Burkoff, if you know Stephen Burkoff stuff, that's his MO, I think. Oh, I, I don't really. So, is he... <coughs> so okay. there's. Um, so is he... He's like a theatre writer. So I, okay. I, I'm doing A level theatre stuff. Um, oh, right. I knew him a lot. Um, he does this this show called Metamorphosis, which is very much about hamming it up and being this uh, big sort of like bleh, thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is now you say it, that's Stephen mm. Burkoff. The impression actually, yeah. that I get from like what I've seen on right. on the web is like, so I think he hammed it up. Uh, I, I'm not sure like 
what his what his feelings were towards Doctor Who. Maybe he thought it was a bit silly, or like a kids show, or whatever. And that was at odds with the director. And then so that apparently that character, the Shakri, was originally going to be like a proper person. But then they changed it to a hologram to like get rid of him. Oh my god! The episode because he was being apparently that's what I've read and anyway. What the hell were those things with the masks on in the oh, hospital? Oh, the Audleys. Yeah. What were they? <laughs> Why? <laughs> they appear like once and then... And they take Brian onto the ship. Why? I don't oh, know. Yeah, I suppose they go onto the ship, because I was going to say they're still on Earth, but I suppose they go onto the ship. But then, then where do they go? They're not there Isn't to the stop the Doctor, like... are they? The ship blows up, but like, where were, just... were they? Were they just standing there watching? <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just Brian or something. It... Oh, my oh. gosh. Uh, oh, yeah. Cause, uh, it's a shame. So I think that's like a really cool design. And the Shakri as well. No, no cool the, monster yeah, designs, but, it, but they're just not... But it's down to the well script. I, I think it's the script which is the problem yeah. because it looks nice. It looks great. And what's that little girl doing in the hospital? I'd forgotten about her. Yeah. What? What's uh. she doing there? <laughs> like surveillance. Well, when, what, what about them gas mask <coughs> thingies or whatever they are? And yeah. Oh, now I think about it more and more. It's that last ten minutes. It's just like. What are you doing? Why? It's oh. that's the weird thing about it as well because it's only like forty minutes long. I think there must have been problems because otherwise it would be longer, presumably, because like it would be forty five minutes. I reckon I there might have been some stuff cut out. I think this I one heard would have as well. Gone. Yeah, I, um, well, I, have I you heard got the complete that... history on on it. I have because yeah. it'd be interesting to see whether the, it did over look. and could I, they cut out a lot. I, I heard that. They they had the script and they filmed it and then in the edit they felt it wasn't working so they kind of sped it up a bit. Yeah, like, yeah. It seems like looking a story back that at those, has been, those has first been ten minutes. Yeah, edit. looking back at the first ten minutes. Um, if you think there are stories like the Pandora opens where the titles don't come until seven minutes in and you yeah. have like that long yeah. long sequence and then like the same amount of time in this story, so much has happened. Like I kept yeah. looking, I think that like, by five minutes in Kate's there and then. Like, time passes so quickly which is kind of the point and it's interesting to see them it's interesting in, in a story which is about the slow invasion how quick it is isn't yeah. it that's really that's bizarre true. the pace yeah. it, it's i get whiplash watching power <laughs> of three it's uh it, it rattles through which it does, in, it I, does. I, I do i quite like the jumping around time stuff um and hearing about a zygon story in the victorian era which yeah. i would have rather seen i don't know thinking about power of three i don't like it i used to really like it mm. i used to be my favorite of series seven part one. Oh, okay um but no 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 I, th- I think for me you see i think i do like it but i, I see the flaws i like the concept i think I, the, the concept, concept of a slow in, of a year-long yeah. invasion is great but it's mm. just and i think it's done quite well in the sense that we, we you know we rattle through this year um, and it's to the point where they suddenly everyone just goes, oh, well, these cubes are obviously useless, and then that's when they attack. But um, but yeah, it's um, no, I'm I'm just I don't I don't think I'm a fan. I'm just thinking <laughs> yeah. about it. No, as we've mentioned, after that then came PS, the little mini sody thing, like the storyboard one, yeah. um, which we just rewatched actually before the video, didn't we? Um, yeah. And uh, and yeah. I think looking back at that now, and like the whole Brian thread, yeah. like you've got the companion's granddad, or dad or whatever, uh, but kind of essentially a granddad figure, mm-hmm. very like Graham in series 11, and the whole thing about um, dad, because this is narrated by Rory, isn't it? Like to his dad, like dad issues, Brian and his dad, you know, little <laughs> parallels and things there. And it's uh, it's kind of family-based human stuff, isn't it? Because yeah. um, weren't you saying that it was, it's weird that well, this and Pond Life, they're both written by a Chibnall, aren't they? It's yeah. It's slightly weird. Yeah, it's its odd. I, I always forget that this is written by Chibnall. I don't know why, mm. but then you think about it because he has written everything for Brian. Yes. Brian hasn't been written yes. by anyone else. I think that was um, it. I think they wanted to give Brian closure somehow because we were looking as well and um, the reason they didn't film it apparently is just because Mark Williams was off filming something else. Yeah. Uh, which is a, It's a shame that we didn't Because didn't I do think properly. that would have been nice to, have, to have got that mm. and... Um, and had it in the canon, so to speak, because it does seem like a you know what happened to Brian because you know they just go to New York and they completely forget about them. Like mm. Rory doesn't mention his he dad at all. Him, no, he's not even thinking. Oh my God, what am I going to well, do? Because Rory dad? at the end of Angels Take Manhattan, he's just he just off, isn't he? he yeah. Angel touches him and then that, that, it's no, Amy yeah, that gets no, the big I rewatched speech. that yeah. and I was like, he is just that he's is gone. just an insult. I think it's an insult to Rory. Anyway, this is a different, mm. a different story, but it is an insult to how 
yeah, Rory I had the, all that great development, and then suddenly he's like, this gravestone has the same name as me. <laughs> Bang, he's gone. <laughs> oh, it's, it, yeah. Yeah. I, I, anyway, that's that's a different script entirely. But yeah, P.S. It's um, that is interesting. Yeah. It's a, it's nice, like you say, to have that mm. closure for Brian. And, yeah. Um, I do think it's quite it's quite nice. It's nice that we got it somehow. Yeah. I mean, I think the di- the dialogue yeah. I was saying is a, it's a bit cheesy at times. Yeah, of yeah. like all the times I snapped at you, I'm sorry, and blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, but no, I think it is nice. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame we didn't get it filmed. It is, yeah. I think now should we just take a, a quick detour to the Torchwood stuff? Oh, that's, just, I um, can't wait for this. Yeah. Oh. Um, so this is from kind of 2006, 7, 8, all this This stuff. is Chibnall's first contribution to the Doctor Who world, it isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, <laughs> but it is. Um, so Chibnall, if you don't know, was like showrunner equivalent on Torchwood, mm-hmm. a developer. I think Russell T. Davies gave him the format and then he developed it and took it from there or whatever. Um, so he wrote what? like about seven or eight episodes across the first two series. And probably script edited um, or helped yeah. out with the other ones um, across. Yeah. The first of those, because obviously Russell today was wrote the opener, introduced the series, whatever. So the first of these was day one. Um, <laughs> yeah. and Sex gas. Yes, this Yay. is the show you're watching. Um, Oh, I, I, mean, I just look back at it now and I think, is how is this written by the same guy? If you say, yeah, you mind like show me forty two, uh, and say this is the showrunner in ten years time, mm. and I would have gone, all right, interesting. Show me day one and say this is the showrunner in you know ten years oh, time, gosh. and I would have gone, you you having a laugh? It, it's Chris Chibnall as well. Like I don't know, would he have been like thirty, forty years just old? Just imagine this time? him. him as his little 16-year-old oh, persona, just yeah. going, you know... I, the thing is, I can imagine, like, RTD writing it, because, like, larger-than-life character. And, yeah, like, oh, yeah and I think it and... seems more like a Rusty Davis does, kind of thing. It? Maybe I it was I Russell. Didn't... Maybe it was Russell Perhaps. who said, this is the story I want you to tell. Go ahead. And maybe Russell yeah, did script maybe, edit it or something. Maybe, um, yeah. Uh, because it, it doesn't feel like a Chibnall script. It doesn't, know. Like... It feels really bizarre, it really does and it. I hate I hate the team in it. I think Owen is the is really horrible in it, even more horrible than he usually is. Hmm. I think that Tosh doesn't have a character in it. I think that Yanto in the whole of series one doesn't get developed very much. Even yeah. the end episode we'll yeah. talk about next. Jack is. I have a problem with Jack in general. He's just quite hmm. a nebulous presence, and you can never really pin him down. I know that's kind of the point, but like. Hmm. He almost doesn't have a definitive character to him because he is this sort of nebulous presence. Um, he's like the Doctor figure, isn't he? But like but, but, they're trying to yeah, put all that stuff that's on him, like the mysterious, particularly in series and, one, in trying to make him sort yeah. of this distant figure. And then like with a the backstory in series two. Oh my! Just, that um, scene, that scene in day one when they're all having Chinese, and then Jack walks off, and they're all like, "So who do you think he is then?" And it's just like you've stopped the story just to. <laughs> that's an that. There we go. So that's a problem oh, I think yeah. Chibnall has in. Yeah nowadays as well and in, in the fact that say like resolution when we suddenly stop the action just to go to a cafe with ryan and his dad it's a bit like in day one that they're all like oh sex gas all this menace oh let's have a, let's sit down and have some chinese and talk about <laughs> ourselves then shall we and then suddenly go back to the action yeah um so maybe that's something that's stuck around i don't mm. know that's just maybe that's just me but, yeah. um so let's wrap right, right for the rest of these so cyber woman oh. episode four i think wasn't it now I, I, I don't mind it, but I just I wish. I mean, there are certain things that I don't like about it. I like the concept, but it wasn't necessary to like to sex up the. No, I, I think that's that's the again like summer, it's like the, the sex gas thing. It's mm. like we're an adult program, so let's we can't Ooh, just have a normal yeah, Cyberman. It's so like, looking back, it's so uneven, isn't it? That kind of first series and like yeah, all the stuff they tried and. It, I think that was I what mean, it was. It was yeah. about testing the waters and seeing it what was. worked. It what had didn't. to. I think it had to be to a certain extent, but um, because series two so. is almost a distillation of what did work in series one, mm. and you know yeah. making them elements bigger. Like Reese is, I guess, a small yeah. element in series one, but then in series two, he really does become a big mm. part of it. Um, so maybe we'll see that with series eleven. You know, taking on board what didn't work and improving yeah. upon yeah. it for series yeah, twelve. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, um, because like the change from series one to series two of Torchwood is just incredible, but yeah, Cyber Cyber Woman is just it's bizarre. Uh, it is a bit, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why bizarre. they didn't use a normal Cyberman. I guess it is it, literally because this is a, 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 a yeah. dark, sexy, um, right now program. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, as I say, the concept of it I quite like, but 
Execution, maybe not. not and so a, a Yanto in it is just... It's, it's such an odd turn for his character... Um, Doesn't that spend most of it crying and stuff? Yeah, like, he, he weeps for the whole weeps. episode. <laughs> he, like, literally, he's in tears. And I, and it gets to the point where you just want to smack Gareth David Logan <laughs> across the face and go, stop <coughs> crying, because this is just... Oh. Anyway. Oh gosh. Um, the next one written by Christian Miller was Countryside. Now, you've not seen I've this, still not watched this. Not watched uh, because I didn't watch it at the time, because I, it had a reputation of being a very gruesome episode, yes. and I'm quite a squeamish person. Yeah. But I think I would be fine with it now. I just mm. haven't gone back to watch it. I think it. I've watched it. Tw- I think I've watched it twice. Have you got the box set? Um, I have, yeah, over there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I hear it's the best of series one. Y- um, yeah, probably. I think either probably that or out of time, maybe, yeah. for me. I would have said I'd have that. to look back at them, because it is just such a weird run, really. But, um, yeah, but yeah it, it, it's quite strong in terms of the, uh, the ideas, isn't it? There are things about it that I don't like. like yesterday, I was just looking for clips, because this is the first episode that um, you probably know that, that Gwen and... Owen become yeah, a thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then there's like a scene at the end where they're like having an affair and stuff, and it's like, okay. Um, yeah. I hated that. I hated that subplot yeah. for the series one. It's a weird one, isn't it? Because, yeah. like, yeah, I, I don't know. Just, like, I just who, don't like it. who, like, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's one of the stronger ones of the series. End of Days, which is the finale. <laughs> Not so much. No. Um, uh, Billis is a very odd character, isn't he? He is, yeah. Billis. It's a very odd performance as well. It's a very odd episode, isn't it? Because it's like it is. Oh. And then and then the bit when Jack literally turns around and points out every character's <laughs> different floor. And like Owen just goes off and it's like telling to F off or something and it's just like yeah. Yay, okay. Um uh... and then Abaddon and he's like there, standing <laughs> and Jack's there going ah! standing where like the Doctor experience oh. Is now yeah. was now roughly that area. Uh, if you, thing about, if you ever, um, if you like, want to see how bad the budget of the first series of Torchwood was, that's all. The, that's the only scene you need to see when Jack's standing there. Yeah, it's just like going, oh, isn't it? and then there's just this bad yeah. CGI bull creature. Oh, it's going to be like the whole uh, threat to the whole of Cardiff, and he's just standing there on a piece of waste <laughs> and by, by the sea. Um, yeah. Not, not great. <laughs> not, not great. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Which I is love the, this. The first series two one. No, I think I've only seen this one once. So uh, I've seen it a few times because okay. it is my one of my favourites of Torchwood. Um, I just love it. I think it's great. I think Captain John Hart's a great character. Um, he's he's almost like the master equivalent for Torchwood, I guess. Yes. Um, yeah. The Moriarty, I guess, kind of figure. Uh, yeah, great stuff. Great cold open with Blowfish in the car. Bloody, <laughs> bloody Torchwood. Yeah. Just great stuff there. Um, again, I've got another bizarre scene actually at the start when Blowfish points out all the characters' flaws as well. He says like, oh, right, I don't remember this. But okay. at the very start, yeah. you know, they come, they come into the on the scene of this whatever's happened, and yeah. and Blowfish is going around like, oh, the Doctor who can't do this and this, the leader who's out of his depth and all that sort of stuff. And oh, it's, right. It's almost like we've come back around. But, yeah. um, but you know, I really do like this episode. I think it's um, I think it's fun. I just think it's kind of thrown away all the immature sort of, oh, we're big and grown-up stuff of Series 1, and it's, hmm. it's, it's matured a bit in a way. Um, so, yeah, I really do like it. Yeah, because I was... Around. So in the Rice to Tell recently, I got to the bit where it's like near the start, I think, where Russell T. Davis is talking about this, and he's like, yeah. um, "Oh, I've got to write the first episode of Torchwood series two. Got to write it. Got to write it." And then just he, he's like, "No, I'm not writing it." And he, um, he's like, "Oh, I'll, I'll write the first, the, the pre-title scene, and then just hand it over to someone else." And obviously, it was Chibnall that um, mm-hmm. ended up writing it. So that's an interesting slant to add to, I guess, as well, yeah. isn't it? I think it is my favourite of series two. I think. Okay. I do yeah. like it. I'd absolutely. I, I think. I know probably what your favourite is. Is it the next one we're going to talk about? Yes, I think yeah. actually, yeah, I think it probably would be. Um, that's a, a drift. Um, I I always think like looking back at this now that this is the one that's like a, a prototype for Broadchurch because it it's yeah. a kid that goes missing, and it's how they deal with it basically. Even and the the style of it is it's on this remote island as well. Yeah, that it's, we go um, to. it's, very it's uncanny, and obviously there's the slant as well with Captain Jack and like the morality of. Because what he's like, he's keeping people on an island or something, and Gran like loses it over that, and um, yeah, a bit weird, but um, I do think it's a really good one though. I, it's a really I, strong I episode. I think it's yeah. incredibly strong, hmm. a very powerful stuff as well. Um, I it's really emotional, um, very real as well. It feels very. It ends, doesn't it? With so the mother goes and sees the child on the island, doesn't yeah. she? And, and it's then... like kind of left 
a bit all mm. open at the end and like a bit and then, unresolved. And then she, you know, and then she sort of says to to Gwen, you know, I'd rather have not known what had happened to him oh, than yes. have seen that. Yeah. And then she's throwing Ooh. away all the, all the kids' stuff and um, oh yeah, just in tears. Yeah. It's really raw and powerful mm. and. Um, it's horrible. It's quite an uncomfortable it watch. Is. It is. Yeah. I think. I think it's one yeah. of. The, I think one of the, probably the most uncomfortable Torchwood episode. Yeah. Um, not in terms of the gore and the violence, but just in terms of how real it feels. And mm. you're right. It, it does feel like a prototype of Broadchurch. In mm. this child goes missing, and um, yeah. It's weird. Yeah. And then after that, because I think he wrote like the final three episodes, basically. That's what I've got here. So there's fragments and then exit wounds, which like sort of form the finale, mm. don't they? So fragments is the one where they're all. It's a flashback. Like a flashback episode, yeah. yeah. Back backstory, mm-hmm. um, which is yes, yeah, nice enough, I suppose. I, I think I, I think it is very good. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. very good story. Um, it, yeah, no, no, I, I really do like it. Yeah, I can't remember. Does it have any? Bearing on what happens in the next episode, or is it just literally like it literally is just a backstory, just backstory thing? Yeah. So it does feel a bit strange how you know we've suddenly got that, um, but it's still interesting but, yeah. to no, no, I think see where they came from, isn't it? Because, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's all that stuff like about Owen, didn't he like lose his, his fiance, yeah, and then that's and, how he's um, become such a cold, heartless yeah. person because you know he's been through all that, and you know, and Tosh is like a hacker, um. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and one Tosh, about it's interesting it, actually. Tosh, Tosh has been in a unit prison. I love that sort of little, little oh, thing. Oh yeah, because it's a unit yeah. who come to, you know, stop the yeah. device being used. But yeah. Um, and then there's a bit with with Jack and Victorian times as well. So it's, yes, and, no, and, I like that. Um, yeah. Nice cliffhanger there, isn't there? Because it's like because isn't that picked up on in the sure. audios? Um, there's one where it's like because there's, set the, with there's, Queen there's Victoria, the guy. There? Well, yeah, and then there's also um, in fragments we see. Jack at the at the Millennium mm-hmm. um, with the old Torchwood crew, oh, who's just and the, the guy who's Torchwood killed. Archive. Yeah, yeah, yes. isn't it picked up in that? Yes, I'm pretty sure it there's is. Because there's a guy yeah. who, you know, that kills everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the last one, Exit Wounds. Oh, Exit um, Wounds is so good. I love it. Yeah, I, again, I think I've only seen. I've maybe seen this one twice. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very strong stuff for Owen and oh, um, particularly near and the, Tosh. End. The, yeah. the end. Yeah, the end. Yeah, the end is great. It's yeah. tear jerking. Um, mm. It's uh, yeah, it's great, and it does feel like a really big threat as well. Um, and a kind of how are they going to get out it's of this? It's like one? nuclear things all over Cardiff or something. Isn't it? Yeah, like, and there's like, like explosions. No, yeah, yeah, it's like a terrorist attack almost, like across the whole of Cardiff, yeah. and um, weevils, you know, attacking all the other oh, weevils. Yeah, you know, uh, the big political figures and whatnot. And it's, it does feel quite, a, you know, it ramps up the tension. And um, yeah, I really do like Exit Wounds. I mm. think it's just it's a great series finale. I really like it. Overall, I guess then just to, to sum up the the Torchwood stuff, um, I don't know what what to say. What would you say about? I I think that in my stuff? opinion, yeah. if you split, you know, like his series one stuff is not no, it's, well, it's awful, uh, and then his series, in my opinion, and then his series two stuff is really strong. I think it's some of the strongest stuff that he's written. Yeah, um, that's, that's fair enough. I, I think, really yeah. do like his, um, his his. I think he he matures as a writer. Um, over that period, it must have been quite a learning curve, I guess, mustn't it? Because yeah. well, I don't know if he'd share anything before that, but I guess that's like obviously he'd done that before coming on to to Doctor Who, hadn't he? So he got the experience from Torchwood. Yeah, I was going to talk about Broadchurch a bit. We could maybe just throw that in as a yeah, let's, a, let's a mini quickly, little um, talk thing. About it. Yeah, because that obviously came what after the Power of Three. But yeah, before, it was, it, yeah. it was what he was doing basically instead of writing for Capaldi or anything Cause, like that. Because um, Chibnall stopped showrunning Torchwood after series two, didn't he? He did, uh, yeah. Because it went back to Russell for Children, Children of Earth, Earth and Miracle Day. You've seen series one. I've seen you? series one. I've seen all three series. Uh, so. And I had that sort of thing of I watched episode one oh, yeah. and I was like, this is very good. And then a, the day a day later, I watched episode two and I was like, you know what, I'm going to watch episode three as mm. well. And by the end, I just binged it in three yeah. days. Uh, it's a stunning series. Mm. And I think it shows how strong Chibnall is when he <laughs> deals with um, something that spans out over a whole series like a and not yes. an, well i guess yeah. in this case it's not an arc but it's like a a, a long ongoing story a storyline yes and i think yeah, chibnall I was so strong at that in broad uh-huh. church series one at least um so it's it's a shame that we didn't see that in series 11 i was saying it in our previous video the yeah. series 11 wasn't i was saying that it's a shame that we didn't get like a not like an overall story. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they could try that out. I but just think something... it would have been... Ni- that, that would have been a bold move to mm. go... 
not like an... It would have been bold than what they did, because he promised risk and boldness, apparently. Yeah. There's a quote somewhere but on the like, Imagine that, 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 an ongoing, and, um, like, a ten-part episode, Across in a way. the whole series, yeah. yeah. But obviously with diversions along the way, but, mm. yeah, it'd be interesting, that. I definitely think this is Chibnall at his best, like, looking... Yeah. At all his writing work. Very good. I need, I need to watch and... series two and three. Yeah. I hear they're, um, they're not as good. Series two, perhaps not not quite. Um, but I still... Yeah, I don't know. There are, there are flaws in each of mm. them. I guess series one's probably the strongest. Is it, isn't um, it so weird to think of it in terms of, like, Doctor Who stars? So, like, Ro- Rory, say, yeah. Rory's a priest. And uh, isn't, Gwen, isn't Gwen in, in the later series? Two, in yeah. series two, yeah. Um, uh, and then they've got... So we've got the Tenth Doctor and Prisoner Zero investigating yeah. <laughs> at the murder of the 13th Doctor's child. And the first Doctor shows up as well. And the first Doctor is yeah. accused of being a paedophile. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's fantastic. And then also, that, that segues in Connarcy to the next bit, because it works the other way. So in series two, um, what's his name's in it? Uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of him. Um, the Lamb. guy that plays Epso, or oh, Epso. Ghost Monument. And then, well, and then um, in series three, you've got Julie Hesmond Howard, she was a Kablam woman. But and Joe jo Miller yeah, is the was, voice yeah. of the robots as well. So I'm trying to think if there are any. So the Kablam other man's ones. being voiced by essentially a pedophile character. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not calling the actor a pedophile. <laughs> I just want to point that out there. Sorry. That's... Yeah. Oh, God. Like that first scene where he gives. The Kablam robot gives Jodie the fares, and it's like. If you just look at that as like the Broadchurch character, it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> Gosh. Um... You know, imagine that. Get away from that. Your family. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, but yeah, Broadchurch is great. Broadchurch, yeah, really amazing, fantastic. And then that kind of brings us to the series eleven stuff now, which yeah. we'll just talk about briefly because it's been mm-hmm. talked about to death recently, hasn't it? But um, I think looking back, like comparing that to the old yeah. stuff, and looking like comparing the two, looking for similarities, differences, recurring things. I mean, obviously, there's, there's the whole family thing, isn't there? Uh, but I mean, this is the first time that Chibnall got to probably start from scratch right yeah own, yeah yeah right his own version of dog two right? and this is probably his well from what we know this is probably his, is his like vision his, of his Doctor vision. Who, yeah what it is now um, um yeah because it probably wouldn't have been the same back then if he'd been writing Doc, uh showing Doctor Who back i think it would have been more like ago. sort of smoffat kind of smithy stuff smithy mm. smith you know that sort of era of the timey-wimey stuff because he was saying in that clip yeah. we watched of like it should be more complicated it should be more complex yeah um, it's weird and he sort of stripped that back all back for series stuff. 11 it's yeah. very simple it's very you know basic mm. not run of the mill but it's it's you know it's um, easy to follow it's interesting looking at you've got a list of the episodes yes. he did there they're possibly my least favourite episodes of series 11 the ones that you the, the ones yeah, that um, I mean I think it's me really... definitely the the finale and oh, yeah. rankings in the UK are yeah. at the bottom. It's the interesting list. though, like that that list of episodes there. Do you know what my favourite is? Uh, of those, of those uh, Trang Conundrum. Yeah, is it? Yeah, the yeah. Trang Conundrum is my favourite one of series eleven. Yeah, not okay. not oh, not overall, but of, uh, like, of, of the Chibnall re- yeah. penned episodes. Uh, even Resolution doesn't quite. Fit yeah, okay. it. It's it's interesting because I I I, I think the guest writers really shone in series eleven. And Chibnall, maybe because he was concentrating so much on that, I don't know whether he let his own stuff slip. In my opinion, I don't know. The more I think about it, I think the opener is, is really strong. I mean, there are some... No, the opener is strong, yeah. The points of logic and things like that. The, the first scene where it's like, Graham and Grace just leave Ryan, the dyspraxic kid, with his bike. Yeah. Go and fetch it. Um, go yeah. off on the train. It's to get them on the train, isn't it? So, um, I know, we've got a train to catch. Yeah. So, off you go. So then they can go and meet the doctor, but still a bit weird. Yaz is a police officer and like thinking about that and like with Broadchurch and like detectives and stuff but it never um, comes up again no it doesn't really does it I, I would have I think that would have been a great like Arachnids in the UK she walks in to she help have, her mum she should have said look yeah. I'm a police officer but the bit with Robertson where it's like hands in the air or whatever and yeah. they got the gun and it's what are you doing like, you're a police officer yeah just Oof. whip out your, yeah. your whatever it is it's oh yeah because Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I think Yaz really needs to be developed in series twelve. Um, if given given her own story akin to I don't know, turn left or you know that sort of story we used to have mm. of a companion, something to kind of define <coughs> a doctor like kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't as much of an issue for me I think as it was for other people in series eleven. But I do get where people are coming from, and obviously, yeah, I hope she is developed more in yeah. in series twelve. 
I guess we kind of touched on this in our previous video and like it's been done to death a bit as well but like in terms of what's to come in series 12 and the future and like what Chibnall's going to do next I mean, it's such an eclectic kind of mix of I think, stuff yeah. isn't it, that he's done but looking at it I think the strongest thing that he does is the family centred stuff definitely definitely. I mean if you look at series 11 the strongest stuff probably is the stuff with Graham and Ryan you know oh, yeah. coming together mm. the granddad and grandson relationship and you know Brian is such a great character in the 2012 episodes uh, the the sort of family drama in the Hungry Earth and Cold Blood. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, and it's almost when it comes to something like 42, when you lose those elements, that it sort of becomes less so like that, if that makes any sense. Quite a lot of people have, have said, I've heard them say, that you can't do sci-fi as well. And I mean, You're right, Would yeah. you agree with that? I mean... I do. Because, I mean, like, looking at torture mm. as well, like Adrift, that's about... The key thing there isn't the sci-fi element. No, it's about no a mother and, really, and her yeah. lost son. And... Exit wounds, I guess, in a way, is also about the yacht Jack and his long lost brother, and 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 the whole the, the the in series two the the group of Torchwood, you know, it becomes more of a family unit, I suppose, doesn't it? I suppose it Especially does, yeah, in like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, they've been together for a year without mm. Jack. They've all gelled together, and it is almost yeah. like a family unit, yeah. which is what Chibnall's so strong at. So I think I would agree. I think when it comes to the that sort of stuff, Chibnall is great. It's the sci-fi where I don't think he's as strong because it just feels like when he does sci-fi, it's a lot of techno bubble and uh, unnecessary techno bubble. But it's interesting. I don't know. I'm not sure where I stand with the sci-fi thing, but definitely, I mean, yeah, the family stuff, human issues, drama, character, whatever. That is his strong point, and that, as, yeah, as you say, that's the thing that, that kind of shouts out for me looking at that list. Which is why I think it's um, a shame that in resolution we didn't save that stuff with Ryan and his dad for an episode in itself. I mean, like, yeah, it felt very yeah. disjointed from the Dalek plot. Hmm. I think it would have been nice if if you'd saved that ep- that episode of Ryan and his dad for an episode where we had similar themes running alongside that. If that makes any sense, possibly. Yeah, possibly. I think we should have just gone all out and had a Dalek story hmm. without that, and then saved that other bit for later. They, yeah, they could have. Yeah, they could have easily done that. I mean, I don't know where else they would have. Put Ryan and his dad, but like Father's Day, you know that's all about Rose and her dad. Mm. We can have, we can easily have a story about Ryan and his dad um, at the heart of the episode, rather than a subplot. I think because that's what it felt it, like. It did feel like a subplot, didn't it? Yeah, and it felt um, like it deserved to be something more than that because we'd have a whole series of Graham and Ryan, you know, coming close together. We have what a scene in a cafe, and then <laughs> true, true, you know. You know yeah. It just kind of happens like that, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So that is Chris Chibnall on Doctor Who, the story so far, updated, all of his stuff we've discussed. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very Miles. much for having Thank me. You. Comment below what you think of Chibnall's stuff, uh, Chibnall's kind of vision for Doctor Who and his ideas and any recurring themes or motifs or whatever. I very much hope you've enjoyed and I'll see you very soon for some more Doctor Who videos. So goodbye for now. Bye.